I learned way back about the importance of, of voice when it comes to either radio or television. Of course, we didn't have television back then. But the radio, of course, required a certain approach from a voice standpoint. Incidentally, my voice right now is not quite right because I have a condition that a great many people are having, and it's called asthmatic bronchitis and uh, it affects your voice, affects your breathing, things of that sort. And I have been bettered by some stuff I've taken, but it is still there and my voice is huskier than usual. But uh, it's, it's all right and it doesn't bother me and uh, I will enjoy talking about anything you want to talk about. My mother was born in 1888, my father in 1887. They married in January of 1910, at which time they were 22, 21 years old. And I was born shortly thereafter. <clears throat> and uh, my, I was named John Alexander Chambliss III because my great-grandfather Chambliss was still alive. He uh, had been a, a, a preacher of whatever you call it in the uh, Confederate Army. And uh, after the war, he went to Charleston, South Carolina, had a church. And uh, my grandfather Chambliss, Alexander Chambliss, was born in 1864, I guess it was. And so, uh, my, my, as I say, I was named John Alexander Chambers III, but Mother decided within a matter of weeks that she would call me Jack because she didn't want to have me and my father both John in the same house at the same time. Because when she called for John, she wanted the one she wanted. And so it began that way. When I was six months old, they moved me up to Lookout Mountain into a house that my grandfather had bought for them. And it was on Hermitage Avenue there, and it's still standing there, 418 Hermitage Avenue. And uh, I grew up there. I was the first of six children. There were four boys and two girls. And uh, we lived in this big house there, and we kept cows, we kept horses, when, when I was very young, we didn't have electricity. We used to have lamps, coal oil lamps. We didn't have a telephone. And uh, so when I was 12, my father had the house redone and modernized and put in a, a furnace system, for example, and more plumbing and so forth. But uh, Lookout Mountain at that time was more like a village than anything else. There were only a matter of several hundred people that lived up there. Uh, today, it's become something entirely different. But uh, everybody knew everybody. Uh, there were colored people that lived on the mountain uh, who worked for the mountain people generally. And then there were certain families that had places on the mountain, wealthy families downtown who would come up just for the summer uh, to get to the cooler air up there. But we were there for the year round and uh, the road up and down the mountain was not paved. There was a streetcar line that ran up the mountain all the way from Chattanooga out to St. Elmo and around the mountain as it went gradually up and came up on the top and came to the top of the incline. And the incline was another way of getting back and forth. But there were very few automobiles and uh, as I say, the roads were not paved. And we went to school at the Lookout Mountain School, which had been built about 1900, and uh, it took you through the eighth grade. So I went through the eighth grade there. I got promoted in the middle of a year, so I got out, I guess, when I was, when I was 14. 
and went off to Webb School. But uh, I and my brothers and the whole family, we belonged to the Presbyterian Church up there, which was a small church up there. And uh, Dad was the Sunday School Superintendent, and it was only a, a hundred or so yards away from our house, through the woods, and we would walk over on Sunday morning uh, through this path in the woods over there. And uh, I guess one of the things that we would do that were fun, sometimes in the summertime, my father would hitch up the horse, one of the horses to the wagon and put us all in the wagon and we would go back to Lula Lake on top of Lookout Mountain, about six miles back. And we'd spend the day out there and have a picnic. And uh, our, our amusements were uh, simple. Uh, we used to play with the neighborhood children. I say neighborhood, they weren't <laughs> any in the immediate neighborhood, but uh, John Smart and his family lived just down the way from us beyond the gravel pit. And uh, we had, uh, of course, we had colored help. We had a colored man named Rabbit that uh, had been working for the railroad and gotten, a, gotten hurt in some way, and he would come every morning and bring in the coal and the kindling and do things like that. Then we had a cook, and then we had a washing, a washing woman, Pearl, who washed the clothes on every, every Thursday. And I used to like to go out after the clothes had dried on the line, I'd go out to a sheet and press it to my face, and it would smell good. And our, we had lots of sensory perceptions. Uh, one of the memories I have is the way that when it rained in those days and the wind blew from the east, we had a front door that it would make moaning sounds when it was raining and blowing like that. And I slept upstairs uh, in, a, in a sleeping porch. And outside the sleeping porch there was a big oak tree. And I, I would listen at the night to the, to the wind in the, in the oak tree out there. And uh, after, after Dad's death, shortly after Dad's death, uh, they cut down the big oak tree and I wrote a poem about it because it was a little like he was. <laughs> and uh, we had, uh, I remember, <laughs> I was telling somebody the other day, I remember that we had an ice box uh, in the room next to our kitchen and uh, the ice man would bring the ice around, they'd put the ice in the ice box. And then there was a drainage from the ice box, a pipe that went through the side of the house and dripped outside. So as the ice melted, why, the water got out that way, and there was there were mint plants that grew out there, and I love to smell the mint plant. I, I can remember it well. And close to that, we had a grape arbor, and I remember the smell of the grapes. Uh, it, our our next neighbor up up the hill at that time was Doc Stewmaker, who was about two or three hundred feet up the up the East Brow Road. And he was the uh, town doctor. He had come up here from Mississippi and was an uncle of the Ralph Shoemaker, by the way, who was with the firm a year ahead of myself and who died just a few years ago. But the, uh, I would lie awake at night on Saturday nights and listen to the music from the club over on the west side of the mountain, they called it, the Lookout Mountain Club, and they had dances on Saturday night. And at midnight, they would play three o'clock in the morning, which it was not, of course, it was, <laughs> it was uh, 12 o'clock at night, but I could hear the music coming in. And when it wasn't there, I could hear at night, I could hear the, the trains over in the West Valley as they came down from the mountain into the valley to come on to Chattanooga. I could hear the blowing of the trains. And I could hear the streetcar the last streetcar that ran at 11 o'clock at night, I could hear it as it came clickety-clack down the rails as it started down the mountain on the last run. So the sensory impressions were, were sharp and, and indelible in a sense. And that's the way it was. Now then, after I got to be 14, 
Actually, I went off when I was 13. <clears throat> but I was 14 a week later, and I went off to Webb School. And uh, I went over on the train and uh, got off at Bell Buckle and lugging this heavy suitcase. It was in the afternoon about 5 o'clock. And I had to carry the suitcase up a long hill to where the school ground was. And just this side of the school ground, there was the boarding house of Miss Lillian Cook, uh, who was a widow who owned the boarding house there. And I stayed there at that boarding house. But uh, then began my three years at Webb. But that is, has gotten away from the mountain. And uh, if there are other things, one of, one of my friends on the mountain was named Junior Hardison. His name was W. Hardison Jr., really. But he lived in a house that was a boarding house, really, that his folks ran. And it was on the car line, shortly after the car line came to the top of the mountain, which it did right where Stone Edge is now. It came to the top of the mountain and then headed west over toward the other side of the mountain. And it came across a big trestle, a high trestle and a long trestle. And on the other side of that trestle was where Junior Hardison's uh, family lived. And I would go over there and uh, because <laughs> They took, took newspapers, we didn't take a newspaper, and they had uh, funny papers that came out once a week. The Cass and Jammer kids and all sorts of things like that. Buster Brown and his tall dog tag, I think it was called. But uh, we, we had good lives, and uh, of course my brothers, my brother Bob was two years behind me, Sizer was a year behind that. And the three of us uh, played together a lot. And uh, then was my sister Susan was the next. And then after Susan, 10 years behind me was David. And then after that, my sister Margaret, who is the only one still alive. And she's at uh, St. Barnabas now and in pretty, pretty bad condition. But I have survived amazingly to where just the other day I had this 95th birthday and uh, I have been blessed with uh, amazing good health and uh, with amazing affection from people, which has made my life very happy. On my, on my family gravestone that I have out at, out at Forest Hills, there is a big marble stone with my name on it for me and my family. And it says Jack Chambliss. And underneath it are the words Amari et Pugnari. And that is my motto, so to speak. It always has been. And uh, the person that uh, runs the place out there says, what does that mean? I said, well, if you'd studied Latin, you would know. It means to love and to fight. And that's been my life, loving and fighting. And I have fought. I've fought as a boxer. I have uh, fought as a advocate as a litigant and I have loved causes to fight for and people and uh, so it's been a full life. Well, you are loved a lot of people do love you. I, I'm aware of it and uh, people that don't really know you. <laughs> you know that's the thing of course of course what you really love in a person anyway is not that person it's your idea of that person the girl that you love is your idea of that person. And what we do really too much, it's as though you've gotten a doll and you proceed to paint that doll and dress that doll in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And that's the, what you love. And yet there is beyond that something that is deeper. And it's very hard to define. Love and of course the name has been, the word's been destroyed today because today they speak of making love as sex. That's, that's not making love at all. That's making babies. Uh, that is a physical attraction or an impulse or a lust or whatever you want to call it. But love is a different thing. And I thought just in the last year, it really basically is a yearning. 
it's a wanting to be complete with that person, so to speak, whether it's in conversation or if, if it's a woman and you're in love with, it involves the other two. But, but that is only incidental. The real, the real love thing comes from a feeling of when you're with that person, you, you are more complete than you are otherwise. And uh, it's a thing that is really the most wonderful thing that can happen. And I, <laughs> of course, it, I guess maybe it's because I'm a romantic, and I am. But I, uh, and I'm glad I have been. If, if, you're, if, if you love people, you're going to get hurt from time to time. You're bound to. And a great many people don't even have friends. Right. Because they know that in order to have a friend, you have to be a friend. And if you do, you've exposed yourself mm -hmm. to hurt. And, and it's that way. When I, when I came back here after law school, I couldn't get up and speak in front of people. My throat would close up. And so my father, within a year after that, got me to take over as superintendent of the Sunday school up on the mountain. And that made me learn how to talk and to talk to people. And then what I would do, I would pick out a single individual as I looked and I would talk to that person. And uh, it, 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 it made a big difference. And uh, of course, my, my life has been that of an advocate, I guess you would say. And uh, an effective advocate is, is, a, is a seldom thing. And uh, a friend of mine, an internationally famous friend of mine named Freya Stark, who was half Italian, half English, and wrote wonderful books. And we came to know each other in midlife, so to speak. She wrote in an essay one time, speaking of persuasion, the true persuader never seeks to convert, but rather to discover to the listener something within that listener's heart of which he had not yet been aware. And every time I see that, it grabs me, mm -hmm. and it's true. Mm -hmm. And Bill Spears, who was a close friend of mine and built his house next to mine on the mountain, and who was the first All-American quarterback named by Grantland Rice, told me about, as a lawyer, he said, Jack, he says, if you have a, a bad case, tell the judge and the jury that you know you've got a bad case and they will immediately try to figure some way to help you because you have been honest with them. Mm. And it's very true. I have completed a booklet that I'm calling Persuasion that has in it 15 or 20 cases that I've had in the course of my life. They're interesting. They're all different in different ways. And uh, one of them was extremely funny, and it was had to do with Cowboy Anderson, who worked on Dad's place out here. And uh, I told about it in my talk at my birthday thing out there. But uh, I, I want to get it done, and get it done soon, because I want people to see what it what it's been like. I no longer tell people that I'm a lawyer. I'm ashamed of saying I'm a lawyer because they have so demeaned the, the term. They have turned it from a, a profession into a business. And uh, I'm, I'm ashamed of it. But I am proud of being an advocate and occasionally a very effective out advocate. And that's, that's what it's been for me. And so... Uh, Where are you on the book at this point? Uh, I am. I have got it all together. I don't know. I don't know how to get it printed. Uh, John Wilson, who did the book for me out at Reflection Writing, the History of Reflection, mm -hmm. he says that I think he can maybe help me. But I would like to have it printed, and it would be a, a fairly small book, but it would be one that I think people would enjoy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, you're you're talking about W. D. E. What years were you there? 
uh, let's see. I went there in May of 74. You see, I was in it. I, I was an owner there at the time it started television. I was, and Elliot Gary was, and Raymond Witt was, and there were one or two others. Carter Parham was there then, I think. Was Carter Parham? Mm, no, no. Um, let's see, there was a fella, uh, Roy Park owned it. Yeah. And he, I think he owned it, I think he had just bought it before I went there. Okay. Uh, and there was a guy named uh, Bill Dunaway who was the general manager at that time. Okay. And I went in there in May of 74 and left in December of 85. Uh-huh. And Luther was there the whole oh, time. Luther's been there. <laughs> Luther is the only person around here who is almost as old as I am. <laughs> oh my goodness. The guy is incredible. But uh, I have uh, I have tapes somewhere, or there is a tape somewhere, where I was interviewed about uh, what Chattanooga was like uh, when I was coming along, and. Uh, I don't, I don't know where it is, though. But anyway... Um, well, any old tapes that you have that you'd like to have transferred up, yeah. then you let me know, and I'll be glad to, uh, to help in that endeavor. How do I get in touch with you? Okay, I can make sure you have a number before I, before I leave. That'll be good. And, uh, That'll be good. The, Incidentally, to me, Sequatchie Valley is uh, God's place. Judge Leslie Darr, the federal judge here, was born over there, and he was the most wonderful judge we had. He became a federal judge. And as I wrote about him when he died, he had a face that looked like it was whittled out of apple wood. And uh, he was a wonderful guy. And uh, I, I love to go, go over into the valley. And recently, my secretary and I and her nephew well over, uh, what is this, seven, uh, the new highway across up to the north. Oh, yeah. Carter J. Yeah. We went down in the valley, then we went to the north and went up the mountain. Mm -hmm. And just before we got to Crossville, we got to the Cumberland Mountain State Park. And I used to take my family up there you. every summer. And uh, back then we would swim, lie in the sun and so forth. They can't swim now. but. Then we left and didn't go into Crossville, but came down to what I call the Dimple of the Universe, which is a cove down there, Grassy Cove. And Grassy Cove is between the mountains, and it's about a thousand acres. And it's the same that it always was. And it's, it's just a wonderful experience to go there. Then we left there and came on over and came down 27. But I have written it up so I can hang on to it. But uh, that, that valley and that area over there, the people still have a sturdy honesty that the mountain people and country people in this country had sure. before we got modern. Tell me about your dad's vision. Well, very briefly, this is how it came about. When he was in his late 20s, uh, he loaned a countryman back on top of Lookout Mountain, I think it was $800, and took a mortgage on his eight or 10 acre uh, little farm back there. And uh, within the next few years, the man absconded, he just left, and dad took the farm over. And he farmed it after a fashion, uh, using the services of a big black man named Charlie Dean who was big and tender and strong and all that kind of thing. And uh, in 1925, I guess it was, Uncle Jimmy Carter started Fairyland Subdivision and he bought up all the land back there and he bought Dad's farm and he paid him a good price for it. But that led Dad, left Dad without any, any farm to fiddle with. And so in the mid-30s, 
he bought 10 acres of land down at the end of Garden Road, or near the end of Garden Road, from a doctor out in St. Elmo, and tried farming it, and it wasn't any good, but then he bought more farming until he had bought the whole 300 acres. And uh, then the war came along. Well, we built stables, a uh, stable down there for the riding horses and so forth. But the war came along, and in the war, my brother David died in World War II. And they got the news of his death the same day I got the news that I was being drafted. I was married with three children, and uh, Mr. Rowell was the head of the draft board, and he told me, he said, you're going to be drafted. He says, you can get a commission, I'm sure. I'd been to VMI, and I said, I don't want to. I said, I, I want to go in at the bottom so that I'll have the experience. But anyway, uh, Dad, I think he and Mother were, of course, shaken by the, what happened. And they began to pour themselves into what we then called the farm. And a few years later, he decided that what the only thing to do, it wasn't any good for farming, was to turn it into a drive through an arboretum. And so he laid out the roads. Mother was in charge of the wildflower development. And uh, Dad would mark the trees where the road was to go. And uh, he had a man that, as he said, painted the landscape with a, a, a bulldozer. And he built a road up onto the mountain, I mean, up the side of the mountain and down on the other side, which isn't used anymore. And he built the ponds. And then he decided that he would name it Reflection Riding. A riding is an area over in England. Uh, there's a west riding, an east riding, and a south riding, I think. And I don't know where the word came from. It came probably from the distance that you could go within a certain time. But uh, anyway, he decided to call it Reflection Riding. And he created a corporation a nonprofit corporation and turned it over to them. And it's governed by a board. And in the deed, it's provided that if they fail to carry on what it was doing, that it all goes to the park service of the government. And so that's the way it came about. He also at that same time gave Provident stock worth maybe $50,000 at that time uh, to the Royal Society of Arts in London to set up and fund a series of lectures called the Reflection Writing Lectures. And I have given such a lecture and presided over others. And uh, another one's going to be next spring, I believe. But uh, that's the way it came about. And uh, mother was the wildflower person, and dad was, was the rest of it. And he loved doing it, and it's had a colorful existence and uh, I think is now in excellent hands and is being handled very beautifully. What would be your vision for the reflection writing? Where would you like for reflection writing to be in the next 20, 30, 40 years? Um, Frankly, I wouldn't like for it to be very different from what it is now. I don't think that it should be artificialized. I think it should remain natural. I would hope that uh, it can build up a, whatever you call a fund, uh, that could, could help it. Uh, I have reached that stage of uh, development, shall we say, where I miss words from time to time. When I reach for them, it's like when you grab a, a watermelon seed, it squirts out between your fingers. <laughs> but. Uh, Reflection writing is substantially, uh, I think, what, what it needs to be and uh, should be in the future. It affords people an atmosphere. Well, my, my talk in, in, at the Royal Society of Arts was the therapy of landscape. And I made the point and I showed 50 pictures, color pictures of landscape all over the world because my wife Ben and I traveled extensively and I've got color photography from all over the world. But uh, 
it's it's there and uh, it is being used properly and I'm very happy about it and about its prospect for the future. And in, in, <laughs> I start that, well, I started that book about its history that John Wilson put together by saying that in the mountain country of Western North Carolina and Tennessee, there was a song that went down in the valley, in the valley so low, lean your head over, hear the winds blow. Hear the winds blow, love, hear the winds blow. Lean your head over, hear the winds blow. And the winds that blow there, you hear the trains, you hear the wind in the trees, you hear the birds, and you hear the voices of the people who have been part of it and therefore still are. It's, it's, it, it's a haunting place, so to speak, and uh, it's a place that one loves.